giants, those who were the product of copulation between the sons of God and the daughters of man. Their creation and spreading wickedness defiled the earth, and so its face was flooded. Their presence persisted, and they continued until the Lord ordered their removal at the hands of his chosen people. In the last days of their dwindling existence, they were seen as figures of strength and champions of lesser beings. But no weapon can outweigh the power of the Lord God. His reach is longer than a spear, his arm swifter than a sword, and his fist mightier than a mace. He is the shepherd, and he will always protect his sheep. In this video, I am to discuss biblical giants with the goal to entice people to read the works within the Bible so that they may follow more closely the Word of God. If you enjoyed the contents of this video, please remember to like, and if you would want to see more, subscribe. First, let's begin with Genesis. Chapter 6 verse 4 reads, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The meaning of the word Nephilim translates to giants. Their creation is thought to be the result of angels breeding with human women. These angels defied God in the watching of humanity, falling for their beauty and teaching them of technologies and techniques that they were not yet ready to learn. This opinion is supported by the events told within the Book of Enoch. This is an apocalyptic religious text ascribed by tradition to the patriarch Enoch, who was the great-grandfather of Noah. Another opinion is that the Nephilim were the spawn of the Canaanites, Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam and Eve. Cain killed Abel, committing the first murder, and God then cursed Cain. Genesis chapter 4 verse 15 to 16 reads, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. The descendants of Cain were the Canaanites, and through the interbreeding of close bloodlines, the Nephilim came into being. This theory helps explain the reason as to how the Nephilim survived the flood. Noah was pure, and so was his bloodline. But the blood of his son's wives were not. Due to the wives, the curse of the Canaanites persisted, and the giants were born again. However, returning to the original theory, it is also thought that through the wives, the fallen angels hid the genetic code of the Nephilim so that their offspring, and therefore own creations, would survive. Giants are not mentioned again until the Book of Numbers. Numbers is the fourth book of the Old Testament and is the culmination of the story of Israel's exodus from oppression in Egypt and their journey to take possession of the land God promised their fathers. The Israelites have been in the wilderness for some years and the Lord is now leading them to the lands in which they are to inherit. They pitch in the land named Paran, and it is here the Lord tells Moses that they are to venture into the land of Canaan. Twelve are chosen from the tribes of Israel, and each go to spy on the neighboring inhabitants. The objective, to see if the people are strong, weak, few or many, whether the land be good or bad, and what cities they dwell within, whether in tents or in strongholds. After a 40-day reconnaissance into Canaan, the scouts returned. The news was both good and bad for the people of Israel. The land flowed with milk and honey, just as the Lord promised, but its people were fearsome. Numbers chapter 13 verse 28 reads, Nevertheless the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great. And moreover we saw the children of Anak there. Verse 32 to 33 reads, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Anak is the forefather to the Anakim. 
The Anakim are who have been described when reporting who it is that dwells within the southern part of Canaan. The sons of Anak, based on the given description, appear to tower over the already large inhabitants of the land. This is no doubt due to their bloodline, as they belong to a much older strain of Nephilim blood. As it is theorized that the Anak are descended from the Nephilim that existed before the flood, this then correlates with the information seen within the Book of Enoch, as the giants of old were said to reach 4,500 feet in height, reinforcing the grasshopper-like comparisons made by the men who reported to Moses. The people in news of what lay waiting over the mountains were afraid of the Anakites. They murmured against Moses, Aaron, and the Lord, even suggesting if it would be better that they stayed in Egypt rather than be led through the wilderness and face these mighty adversaries. Only two of the twelve men sent to scout the lands maintained their faith in the Lord and his power to overcome the enemy. The rest, along with the people, wailed in fear. The Lord's response was one of anger. He withheld his power from the current Israelites, saying that they will not inherit the land that was promised only that their children will know of its bounty. Many of the people rose on the next day in hope to regain the Lord's favor. They were to fight the enemy in the valley, who were the Amalekites and the Canaanites. But the Lord was not with them, and they were defeated. The two of the twelve who did not question the Lord's abilities were Joshua and Caleb. Caleb was of the tribe of Judah, and that detail will be brought up again later. During the wandering within the wilderness, the Israelites encountered more giant adversaries. Og of Bashan faced Israel in the battle at Edre. Israel had seen many recent victories in driving out the Amorites from their land, and so God reaffirmed to Moses, saying, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand, and all his people and his land, and thou shalt do to him as thou didst unto Sion king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. Both Sion and Og were considered kings, but for Og, his crown wasn't the only thing to be lost. Og was said to be the last remnant of the Rephaim. The Rephaim were descendants of a giant named Rapha. The Rephaim were described to be as tall as the Anakim. The Rephaim also are referred to as the Zamzumim and the Emim. The Rephaim are mentioned earlier in the Bible, within the book of Genesis. Chapter 14 verse 5 reads, And in the fourteenth year came Chedorlaomer, and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emins in Shaveh Kiriathaim. Chedoloma was a king of Elam, an ancient civilization centered in the far west and southwest of modern day Iran. During his time, he campaigned against five Canaanite city states in response to an uprising. This was all taking place in the time of Abraham, and Abraham would later defeat Chedoloma, the giant killer, to save his nephew Lot. Returning to Og, his bed was said to be made from iron and was a massive thirteen and a half feet long and six feet wide, meaning Og stood around ten to eleven feet in height. Og was king over six fortified cities. His land of Bashan was seen as a place of darkness, either due to the valley or the pagan ways of the Rephaim. The light would ultimately conquer the dark, as God promised, and after Og and his sons were slain, his former cities were then occupied by the Israelites. Moving forwards in time, after Israel had paid the penalty of wandering an extra 38 years in the wilderness, Caleb and Joshua were the only men of the previous generation to inherit the promised land. During the conquest of Canaan, Joshua expelled the Anakim from the hill country, and Caleb drove them out of Hebron completely. However, the Anakim were not totally abolished, as they fled the newly controlled region of the Israelites and remained in three Philistine cities, Gaza, Gath and Ashdod. The Philistines have been thought to be the original sea people who left the coastal areas of Greece, Asia Minor and the Aegean Islands and permeated the eastern Mediterranean coast. They were renowned for their skilled work with iron tools, forging weapons and their ability to make great chariots. These chariots dominated the flat coastal plains but were ineffective in the mountainous region of central Israel. Nearly 400 years after the death of Moses, the giants who fled from Joshua and Caleb are seen mocking Israel. The Philistines had gathered their armies together 
and camped on the southern side of the Valley of Ella, facing the Israelites on the northern side. A champion of the Philistines and feared adversary of the Israelites called out to their camp, saying, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man, that we may fight together. For forty days he did this, until one day a young shepherd overhears his challenge. This boy would go on to be the second ruler of ancient Israel and Judah. He founded the Judean dynasty and united all the tribes of Israel under a single monarch. His son would be Solomon, who went on to expand the empire that his father had built. But for now, he is the overlooked son of a man named Jesse from Bethlehem. He is the youngest of his eight brothers, and whilst his older sibling went to fight for their king against the Philistines, he was to stay behind and tend to the sheep. He was given orders to transport provisions for his brothers on the front lines, and this is how he came to overhear the bellowing threats of the feared Philistine. The soldiers around him said, Have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said in response, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? The words that David spoke, then made their way back to the ears of King Saul. And so, the king sent for David. David, emboldened by his faith in the Lord, said, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. It is here that Saul refuses David's offer, stating that he is too young for such a task. As the Philistine has been a man of war since his youth, David then tells of his encounters within the wilderness when having to protect his sheep, where, on separate occasions, he killed a lion and a bear. He states that this Philistine will fall just as they. He then reaffirms his trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul then allows David to go forth, but not before equipping him with his armour. He put on the bronze helmet, the chainmail, and fastened the sword to his armour, and then tried to walk. But the weight was too great, and so he removed them. He remained in his shepherd's attire, and picked five smooth stones from the brook, placing them in his pouch along with his sling. David and the Philistine meet. It is here that David can get a proper look upon his foe. This was Goliath of Gath. He wore armour amounting to 125 pounds in weight and carried a 15-pound spear. His height was 9 feet and 6 inches, and his physique was great. Goliath cursed David and his lord and said, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David responded, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Goliath then approached David, spear and shield in hand. David went into his bag, armed the sling with a stone, and flung it towards the giant. The stone struck Goliath in his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. David then stood over the fallen giant, unsheathed his sword from his hip, and cut off his head. Goliath's armour was said to be of a scaly design. The striking of David's stone to his forehead imitates the oracle that God cast upon the serpent in the Garden of Eden. The Lord said, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In conclusion, 
giants have defiled mankind since their creation. They were the spawn of evil that erupted out of their mothers, killing them. They then bred with themselves and covered the face of the earth. Their hunger could not be sated, and they began to devour livestock, and then man. The Lord flooded the earth to cleanse it of this corruption, but the bloodline survived and re-emerged amongst the new world. They then became a dwindling breed, as where they were found, the Lord sent his people. The tribe of Judah, the lion of the Israelites, would slay one of the last remnants of that ancient wickedness, and from the taking of his head, a hero was born. The blood of this hero would go on to birth the Saviour. He is the Word made flesh. He who died for all the sins of the people, past, present and future. Through him you may know the love, comfort and the strength of the Lord. No challenge is too great. No foe is too tall. No objective is too far. His name is Jesus Christ and he can save you. As mentioned in the beginning of this video, the aim is to get you interested in the works of the Bible. If your interest has been piqued, then please read the original text yourself. I recommend the channel, Expedition Bible, where archaeological finds backed by scripture are presented. If you're looking for truth or wanting to know more about the biblical past, then it is a great place to start. If you have additional commentary on biblical giants, and the events discussed within this video, then please leave a comment. I look forward to reading them. If you enjoyed, please remember to like and subscribe as it helps the channel immensely. God bless and goodbye.